Fox News alert millions of American families. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for CBS News. I'm George Thomas. We begin with the latest morning. Here at St. John's Basketball Mark, there are certainly a lot of factors here at the LAPD. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for CBS News. Watch. I'm George Thomas. We begin with the latest in the coronavirus pandemic. Number of cases here in the U.S. Rise to Liberty podcast, the best podcast you've never heard of, fighting for free speech and spreading the message of liberty. Find us at risetoliberty.com for everything related to the show, including our merch, social media, episode player, and much more. risetoliberty.com slash blue dress for a special piece of merchandise that a portion of the proceeds will go, uh, will be donated to savethechildren.org to help fight child trafficking. Thomas Queter is rolling for New York State Senate. The people of District 52 have been used and abused by a bloated and corrupt government. Thomas has been fighting his whole life and is now taking the fight to the ones responsible. Give the people of District 52 a fighting chance and head over to tomfor52.com and leave a donation. Greasy Porcupine's Mobile Auto Repair, helping the people of Arizona to maintain or repair their vehicles for a reasonable price. Little money? No money? Greasy Porcupine still wants to help. Open Monday through Saturday, 24 hours a day. Just visit greasyporcupines.org or call 602-845-0105. So, I have a very special guest today. She is the child of Cuban immigrant parents who fled communist rule. She has become, or she has become a Florida-based entrepreneur, real estate investor, and hemp farmer. She is chair of her local community council, candidate for county commissioner of District 10 in Miami-Dade Dade County, sorry, <clears throat> and liberty activists with a focus on Cuba. Somehow through everything, she still finds time to be a loving mother of four. It is a great honor for me to welcome to the show the libertarian warrior queen, Martha Bueno. Thank you so much for being here, Martha. How are you doing? Thank I am doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. What an amazing intro. That sounded like <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I, I try, you know, get out of the gate Thanks. strong, so... Thank you. It sounded amazing. It's like, wow, I want to meet that person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, got to impress. Got to impress. So, yeah, let's let's uh, get right into it. Um, what does liberty mean to you? Oh, wow. You are going to hit with a good questions from the beginning, aren't you? Oh, yeah. um, what does liberty mean to me? Wow. That that's it's hard to quantify. Um, to me personally, it's everything. You can't have, you can't live a life worth living if you don't have liberty. To me, it's the most important thing. Anything after that is just, you know, a bonus. So, um, I guess maybe it's a little more important to me or something that I think about more because my entire life has been, um, built on something, you know, on this notion of liberty. Uh, as you mentioned in the intro, my parents uh, fled communist Cuba and um, because they did and my entire family stayed behind in Cuba, my grandparents, my extended family, I've grown up, um, you know, without that benefit, without having family and and I don't have the liberty to go back and see them. And now that they've mostly passed away, I don't have the liberty to go and ever make up for what's been taken from me. So I think because of that, liberty to me is just the most important thing and as we're watching here in the u.s liberty kind of slip away from us 
it's I'm reminded of why we do the things that we do as libertarians, why we fight for it. Because, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm probably going over what you asked me in the question, but looking at Australia right now, um, I'm married to an Australian and he can't go home to see his grandparents and his mom um, and his family. And so it's it's kind of like history repeating, but this time in a English speaking country. And that's something that I don't think the world has seen before. So. You know, liberty is everything. Well, uh, regarding Australia, uh, I don't think anyone's seen such a, uh, I mean, for lack of a better term, an impressive authoritarian regime roll in so quickly. So um, quickly. I mean, was, Venezuela happened quickly in yeah. relations to, you know, like I compare that. I, I grew up in Venezuela, a few years in Venezuela. And so... I compare what happened in Cuba to Venezuela, and I'm like, wow, that happened fast. And then Australia came and was like, hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, it was overnight. 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 We didn't see that one coming. I mean, um, I got married in Australia in uh, 2017, and it was like, I remember thinking, wow, this is kind of like a really free country. I don't mind living here. And now I'm like, mm, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> yeah. That was fast. I mean, people getting arrested just for hanging out at the beach or, I mean, having to... You can't go like five miles from your... Or I, I'm sorry, it's kilometers, so it's even less. Yeah. You can't go five kilometers from your home. Um, so, yeah, this is crazy what's going on in Australia. Yeah, and the, the fact that some people are just thinking that that's normal, they're okay with it, they're defending it even. Yep. Uh, it's, it's really eye-opening to uh, see where loyalties lie for some people. It's crazy to watch. I mean, again, I saw this happening in, in Venezuela, but it wasn't like this because, you know, this, this whole medical, the fear put into you, we have to shut down or you're going to die, is something that I don't think we've seen before in the history of at least, you know, whatever recent history that we kind of study and, and, you know, know. Um, it's just amazing how quickly and to see these people that I believed felt the way we do, you know, in terms of liberty. I mean, Australians used to be like um, kind of the, the FU culture, you know, like this. No, we're you know, you can't control us. We you know, we we ra wrestle alligators during our lunch break you know like we're this big macho <laughs> culture and then now they're like oh no no this thing is going to kill us so we're okay with it. it you know we're okay with the way things are happening we're okay with being told that if we leave australia we can't come back um in in the case of of my husband if he goes to australia to visit his family he can't leave so it's basically kidnapping Mm. Um, so, he, you know, he has to make a choice whether his life here in America with his job and his family or to go back to Australia and um, not be able to come home. So he's making a choice. And um, I, I just can't believe that I, that's where we're at. I, I can't even imagine having to make that choice or being thrust into the position to have to make that choice um, due to somebody else's will um right right you know, and, and i mean and his grandparents are in their 80s so you know we know that there is a time limit here we know like you know no they're healthy thankfully but there's a time limit how much time do we are we gonna have to go back and and make up for the years that were lost the last two years particularly year and a half um that we've been well i guess we'll go to australia when this is over i guess we'll go there i guess we'll go see them <laughs> And, and it's just extending and extending and extending and extending. And it's, it's a sad situation. At least in my mind, this is just like horrible. So um, I hate to sound like Debbie Downer here. We're no. starting off the show. With like, no, it's, this is, you know, it's, it's the just, truth, it's though. sad. It is. It is. And again, you know, I, this is my reality that I grew up in. The fact that I couldn't go home. I could never. I've never stepped foot in Cuba. I was born here in the U.S. And, um, you know, to immigrant parents. So I feel like I'm caught in the middle. I'm not... I'm not 100% American because my culture is Cuban. My my fa family grew up, you know, I spoke English and uh, and Spanish mostly. And then I'm not exactly a Cuban. I've never gone to Cuba. So I'm kind of caught in the middle. But that whole not being able to go home, not being able to grow up with an extended family, not being able to do these things, you know, and, and watching it happen to, again, 
Australia, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that's the crazy part. Because if you told me, oh, well, this is happening in Argentina or this is happening in, you know, um, any other place in Latin America. Eastern Europe or. Right. In in Africa somewhere, I'd be like, well, that kind of makes sense. You know, yeah, I can see that happening. But Australia. And I mean, Britain isn't too far off. In, in terms yeah. of like, I mean, they haven't been as bad as Australia. So I, I will say that much. I mean, they're not as bad as Australia, but they they have gone total authoritarian, too. So it's just, you know, I can't believe that this is where we are with COVID. Yeah, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, it, it just seems like the the pressures from Big Brother, Big Sister, I mean, wh- whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, powers it be you know it it just they're bearing down on everyone harder and harder as things go on um and it's not selling their case it's actually you know um reinforcing the idea that people shouldn't listen to them so right and it's crazy to watch because like you know as as somebody who's been paying attention to politics for a while now we see that like the will of the people isn't what drives things. So in the case of cannabis, which is something that I'm totally passionate about and have been for a while, you know, we see people are like, well, this is kind of, you know, 38 states have some type of legal marijuana laws, right? Legal in some way, shape or whether it's medical or whether it's full recreational, whatever. So you have 38 states around the country that are like in favor of this. And yet we can't get legislation to stop putting people in jail. We still jail over a million people in this country every year for cannabis. So it just makes no sense. So now we're seeing, you know, this like push with COVID and that doesn't make sense either. So where are we go- like, how is this a thing that in America we just whatever people want is the opposite of what happens, you know, and these people that we elect to supposedly represent us all of a sudden have this insane amount of power to just control us. And it's it's frightening to watch how people don't realize and recognize that they have no control over their lives. I've been posting recently on social media about like property taxes. And most people will, will, will gladly say, but hey, you know, at least they pay for our roads and our education and like, <laughs> I don't know what to say to these things. I'm how do you respond to that? You know, people are just like, well, I mean, but my money's going to these good causes that aren't really happening. So it's just, it's so wild. Like, I mean, this year's the, been wild. Yeah. I mean, geez, the, the past two years, it's been just a roller coaster. And it seems to be, you know, usually when you ride a roller coaster, the worst part of it's right at the, right at the start. And it's, <laughs> uh, it's like we're in reverse. It just keeps getting I worse. I love roller coasters. That's a horrible uh, <laughs> analogy. I, know. I, know. I love roller coasters. Like, what do you mean the worst <laughs> part? I like. I want to ride roller coasters. I don't want whatever's happening. Yeah. Whatever exactly. this is, it's not a roller coaster. And if it is, it's like the haunted house of roller coasters. Get me off of it, please. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, being stuck on a roller coaster for 12 hours while it's just consistently going through loops. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe that at that degree, yeah. I, I probably wouldn't like roller coasters if I have to do it for twelve hours. Yeah, right. <laughs> so maybe for two minutes of this, we would we wouldn't mind authoritarianism for two minutes, but it's gone on for like like you just said, twelve hours. So we're, well, I mean we're good. that that's that's the thing. As soon as you give up a an inch, they take a mile, and once you give them anything, you ha- literally have to you know fight for it back, right. and. It, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program, you know? Tell me about it. Uh, Again, cannabis. We can, I mean, this is a subject that I could go back to 20 million times. Cannabis has been illegal for over 80 years now. Yeah. It's, It's like we implement things and then it's almost impossible to change. You know, yeah. I don't understand how we were able to change prohibition in this country so quickly. Alcohol prohibition anyways. Yeah. And then cannabis, it's 80 years of it. I mean, it's just mind boggling. Well, I mean, but, yeah. one of the reasons why uh, alcohol prohibition was recalled uh, so quickly, at least comparatively, was the rising crime. Uh, except for this time, there's even more of a rising crime, you know, due to uh, the war on drugs. Thanks, Nixon. 
Right. Um, but it's and, just not only in the U.S. You see this rise in crime oh, yeah. in Latin America. And then, of course, those people that we've caused the rise in crime to, to be affected by, they want to come over into the United States. And we're like, no, no, but you can't come here. We'll destroy your country, but please stay yeah. home. Don't come here. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it so you can only be a producer of narcotics. Uh, we, we will destroy your economy. Uh, we will import the narcotics. But nah, that, that's about it. That's all we. That's all we're gonna give you. It's uh, really disheartening, honestly. Speaking of, uh, you know, Latin America. So let's jump into Cuba. Um, let's do it. What is happening is, in my opinion, not only a historical moment, um, but in my humble opinion, uh, one, one of the most important events taking place and it needs to not be swept under the rug, which is one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to have you on. Um, it I is mean, being swept under the rug. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Unless you live in Miami. So you have to realize That's that true. I am like in ground zero of what's going on in Cuba. I, I get to hear it all day, every day. Um, Twitter, my Twitter is basically all Cuba. So, so unlike the rest of people, I hear it 24 seven, but I understand that outside of my little bubble yeah. of Miami, everybody north of here, Fort Lauderdale and on, nobody knows what's going on in Cuba and it's frustrating. It is. So w would you mind explaining, uh, however quick or long you would like <laughs> to take, uh, what is happening in Cuba, uh, just for those who don't know and also why it's important. Sure. So let me just go back a little bit. Cuba's had a dictatorship for 62 years. That's important to note um, because I think people, you know, depends on who's listening to this. So a lot of people tell me, you know, like, oh, but they have the greatest medical system or they have all. The That's not the case. And what happens in a dictatorship um, when people can't freely speak is that they'll, you know, they can't correct these things. So it's just like uh, North Korea, right? You can say they have the best medical system and there's really nobody to, to say that's not true. So Cuba's had a dictatorship for 62 years. And, um, you know, while people have protested off and on over the years, it's never been a coordinated effort. One of the reasons there's never been a coordinated effort is because Cubans don't have a way to e uh, easily communicate with each other. If you tell somebody in person that you are not a communist, which is the only legal thing you could be, the only political position you can have is to be a communist in the Socialist Party, um, you know, you, you're subject to, go to going to jail, to being reported, to um, being beaten, to all these things. So people don't freely talk about politics. Politics and civics aren't taught in school. Um, you know, so it's been very difficult to get people to think and act. Um, so on July 11th of this year, we had a historical accomplishment. And that is that for the first time in the history of Cuba, there were uprisings in major cities across Cuba. Uh, over 40 cities in Cuba had full blown people out in the streets protesting. And for the most part, they were peaceful, peaceful on the part of the protesters, not peaceful on the part of the administration, which um, took to the TVs of Cuba. Cuba has um, state controlled media and uh, the unelected president. And I say it like that because he wasn't elected. He was literally appointed. Uh, the unelected president of Cuba, Miguel Diaz Canel, took to the airways and said um, the streets belong to the revolutionaries. And he gave combat orders to the military to the state security, to all. He said that if anybody's out in the street, you know, the combat orders have been given. You can interpret that however you want. In my opinion, that was a call to civil war. So uh, the people, you know, the, the, they sent out the, the Black Berets. They sent out, they even brought home troops that were stationed in Venezuela because Cuba is, um, you know, the reason why Venezuela is the way it is, partially because of Cuba. Um, so they brought back those troops and they started repressing people in the streets, in their homes. Uh, there's videos of state police going into people's homes and shooting them. There's videos of um, just people being beaten on the streets. There's videos of buses of the state bringing people in, plain clothed people with sticks to beat protesters. I mean, and then you have the aftermath. Protesters that were out peacefully protesting have received 
up to 20 years in jail. Um, and I'm talking about 15, 16, 17 year olds included in that, because in Cuba, being a child, it, it's not like in America where, you know, under 18, you're pretty much, um, you're a child, so you're not going to be tried like an adult. Not in Cuba. You get a swift trial within 24 to 48 hours of, of being detained. So obviously you don't have time to mount a defense. You don't have time to hire anyone. Not that the system works the way it works here, but whatever. You don't get a defense. You get sentenced to extremely long um, you know, sentences in jail. Um, there's cases of entire families, mom, dad, children, all in jail at this moment. And then we have over 800 people that have been either missing or detained that we just can't find. Um, Black so there's Right. So there's just this horrible, horrible repression. And it wasn't that just happened those days after the protests ended. People were still being arrested, still being, um, you know, if it, somebody was identified at the at the marches, they would, you know, they would receive a, a message from state security. And so what is happening today, this was, you know, from July 11th till now, um, a group of very brave uh, Cubans decided to put in paperwork to tell the government that we're going to continue to protest. We're going to protest on it. They started off with November 20th. And of course, what did the Cuban government do? They turned around and they said, well, that's so funny that you should say that. You know how we have Military Day in December every year. This year, congratulations, it's going to be on November 20th. It's actually going to be on the 18th, 19th and 20th. And then the telecommunications company came out and said, oh, funny you should say that. We are going to do maintenance on all Wi-Fi and all communications in Cuba on the 20th. So, right. I mean, <laughs> what a coincidence. Had nothing yeah. to do with them putting Weird through timing. the paper. Weird timing. Yeah. I mean, so then um, the protesters said, well, that's fine. We'll just accommodate you. We'll do it on the 15th because on November 15th, um, the airports open back up. And Cuba, you know, it's it's the time where the snowbirds like to come to the Caribbean waters from all over the world. And yep. so this is Cuba's moment to make money, November 15th until some point in March. And um, the protesters were like, great, November 15th, we'll, we'll be on the streets welcoming um, all of those, those people that want to come in. And so now the Cuban government is really cut you know uh, um going to people's homes and threatening them i just posted a video two or three days ago on my twitter of um a woman coming to Siley's house Siley is one of the main faces of the opposition in cuba she's a young woman she's in her 30s she's braver than i mean i i respect this woman immensely um and they came to her house and they said we are not going to permit you to go out and it was a woman standing at her doorstep, you know, telling her, I'm not going to let this because this is the, the revolution that, uh, you know, Fidel Castro himself created. And you're, you guys aren't going to get away with this. And it's amazing to watch. I, I was in shock, to be honest, because even though I've heard this my whole life, it's something else to watch a full grown adult come to your house, knock on your door and be like, you are not going to do this thing because I don't want you to do it because this is the revolution. So um, that's where we're at. We are basically waiting for stuff to happen in Cuba, waiting for people to just probably be beaten. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm scared beyond belief. I have no idea what's going to happen. And then, of course, all the additional stuff that happens in Cuba, which is there is no food to eat. There is no medicine. Um, COVID is absolutely real. People are dying. Um, hospitals in Cuba, there's very little to no medicine and you have to be a communist or pertain to the party to be able to qualify for certain things. So, um, you know, with with uh, People for Liberty, they've been backing me. We've we started an organization called People for Cuba. and We've been basically what amounts to smuggling medicine into Cuba. And when I mean that, I mean, um, <clears throat> we get it directly into people's hands. If it goes through the Cuban government, then it goes to um, the Cuban government. It goes to the Cuban government, exactly. So we've been getting it into people's hands directly. And in order to do that, we have to go through many different channels. So yeah. it's a it's a, it's a a tough mission, um, but we'll just keep doing it. I mean, obviously, the amounts that we've gotten to are not nearly enough. <laughs> I mean, yeah. um, there, this needs I, to be a much bigger effort, but we'll do what we can as long as we can. I mean, any little bit helps at this point, honestly. Right. I mean, we are witnessing in real time the collapse of you know a communist socialist organized government and i mean this this is just the natural order of how all of these systems end up crumbling 
you know? Right. Um, right. It was, it was bound to happen. And unfortunately, because the government restricts all the citizens from doing any, anything, you know, growing their own food. I, I know uh, Cubans can't even fish. It's yeah, like, they can't fish. You're it's on an island. The most amazing thing is <laughs> they don't have anything to eat. They live on an island. And, you know, one of the things that caught my attention the most is um, when speaking to Cubans on the island, they're like, we don't even like fish because we've never had it. We don't know how to how to eat it even. So they, you know, it's even a running joke for them that they're like, no. we don't even know how to fish. They, most Cubans don't even know how to swim. And again, they live on an island. Like the culture has fallen apart. And this is part of, you know, the, the, the unintended consequences of, of communism. How, how is it that people who live on an island don't learn how to swim, don't learn how to fish, don't learn how to... And then, you know, they aren't allowed to farm for themselves. So you had an entire culture of farmers that no longer know how to farm. And everything has to be done by hand. Imagine cutting cane sugar in the 21st century by hand with a machete, with like an old machete. I mean, it's just, it's so hard to explain to people who are used to the way things happen in America, what's going on in Cuba. It's, it, it's a complete collapse of society. There's no other way. Yeah. To and it's. It's honestly amazing because you you think uh, the government there would out, honestly want to be able to uh, have efficient farmers. Uh, you think they would want them to be able to uh, you know use machinery to get the crop in sooner, to be able to have raw materials to be able to trade on the world market. But I mean, what do I know? You know, right. it's uh, it's one person controlling the whole party. Uh, it's more it, than it's, one person, though. There's, there. I used well, to believe that it was, but it's really the the Castro family. So there's yeah. the two branches, Fidel and Raúl, and then their now extended family because of their children and their grandchildren that are that are controlling things. So even though Diaz Canel is the leader, um, the quote leader on on paper, it's still the Castro family. So there there's there are people in Cuba that are well off, um, and this is something that's extremely hard to wrap your your mind around. At least for me. Um, I just assumed everybody was miserable. And it turns out that there's two completely different societies in Cuba. There's the rich and the powerful that are connected and, you know, high up in the Cuban government. And then there's everybody else. People but willing to put in the work. Of course, yes. If you've been, you know, you've been a soldier. It's the your mafia. Been, it's the mafia, <laughs> exactly. But this is the thing, you know, when you talk to people who are socialists, they're like, we should all be the same. Well, look at this example. It's right in front of you. This society, if you look at everything Castro ever said, if you look at what everyone, you know, claims that socialism is, Cuba is that. But look at it. There's two classes of people. Michael Moore made this movie about, you know, the Cuban uh, health care system. And he went to the hospital that Fidel and, and Raul and everybody could go to. Of course, that hospital is amazing. Of course it is. It's for those people. Because that's where he, all the money is. Right. That's where, I mean, of course, Fidel, he even had in his own home and like an entire hospital system for himself. So, of course, he's going to have the best of the best. But then, you know, everybody else, nothing. So why didn't he go to other hospitals? Why didn't he, you know, if he was really serious about exposing how amazing Cuban healthcare is, why not go to these other places? Just recently, um, you know, socialists were talking about how Cubans developed a COVID vaccine and how amazing it is. Guess what? The president of Cuba hasn't taken either one of those vaccines that are available. That came out. That was somebody leaked that information. I wonder why. I wonder why he wouldn't take his own vaccine that he's forcing prisoners in Cuba to take because they're experimenting on the prisoners and he's not dumb enough to take it. I mean, he's dumb, but he's not dumb enough to take it. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, when you see things like that, uh, to me, it seems really obvious what's happening. I mean, uh, even just the fact that, uh, you know, bring it, to the jab, the shot, whatever, the vaccine, that's not a vaccine. Um, well, theirs might be different. Remember, they have... Yeah, that, they, that is they're true. They're not using the Pfizer, the Modernas. They're, they have two, the, um, the Soberana Dos, which was created with Iran. And then they have the Abdala, which I, I'm not sure if that was with Iran as well or some other country. So they have two that they're trying out. Um, 
but they don't have any data. And and it's yeah. crazy because people will tell you that their vaccines are the most amazing in the world, but there's no data to back it up. Well, it's, uh, you know, really easy to say things like that, though, when you don't let any information off the island, you know, and any information that does leak off the island is because of, you know, VPN usage and, you know, uh, people basically smuggling, leaking, um, you know, whistleblowing whatever yeah. little bit of information they can. So, uh, of course, they can turn around and say things like that. that everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, we're great. So, you know how you can show that they're, they're so full of, you know, poop um, <laughs> is uh, their hospitals that they claim that they have all these vaccines against cancer and all these things. Well, Fidel Castro died of cancer and so did Chavez when he went to Cuba to get, you know, uh, treatment. And, and I'm not saying that the United States would have saved them either. But if your supreme leader dies... I mean, they of, tried to kill him a couple of times. <laughs> right. But no, I mean, like, if it would have yeah. been somebody else with the same condition. I'm not yeah. saying that these were savable conditions and they would have been saved elsewhere. I'm just saying, like, people are like, their healthcare is so superior. Yeah, well, then why do their leaders die of, like, these diseases? Especially Chavez, who yeah. was, you know, Cuba's child, love child, um, giving them all the oil from Venezuela. They would have wanted to keep him alive, I'm sure, and that didn't happen. So um, they can say whatever they want to say, but the proof is in the pudding. Well, and I mean, it's once again, to me, uh, and I also know to people like you, you, you yourself, uh, and lots of other people, it's blatantly obvious that this regime is propped up by the threat of force and violence. Uh, totally. Like you said, political opposition is not tolerated on any level. Censorship of information is rampant. Food is scarce. Medicine is practically non-existent. The lives of the citizens are controlled in every aspect. And this is resulting in horrific human rights violations. So in your opinion, why why is Cuba not front page news? Why Why is this being ignored? You know, that's a great question that I ask myself quite a bit, and I wish I had a good answer for you. Be, you know, it's, I think that's kind of what we're seeing here in the U.S. as well. I don't necessarily think anymore that our leaders, um, our quote leaders, are in fact care about us. And I mean, I know it's been like a, a tinfoil hat thing for a while, and we're all like, well, you know, but it's kind of obvious now more than ever to me. Nothing makes sense, right? So I talk about this quite a bit. Well, if you're if if the government cared about you, then why do they do these things? So for example, if the government cares about you, why is it illegal for you to go get your medicine cheaper across the border, whether it's Mexico or Canada? They're forcing you to pay more in this country. It's not about your health. It's about them making money. So when you look at things from that point of view and you start analyzing okay so this covid vaccine well we never were allowed to compare the covid vaccine versus people who had gotten sick and recovered and their immunity why not well everybody has to get the vaccine or you're going to lose your job well why well why can't aren't we allowed to know versus you know people who got better so you know and and then you're labeled an anti-vaxxer or this there's this like misinformation campaign against you and so when you start comparing that to, well, that happens in Cuba. So if I talk about the government, the Cuban government, for example, Saili, the, the woman that I was talking about earlier, um, the one that's the face of Amarillo y Medio, which is this, there's two main groups that are pushing forward this, this protest that's happening, that's pushing forward for freedom. And it's this group called Archipelago, and then there's another one, Amarillo y Medio. So Saili is from Amarillo y Medio. And she, um, she's being accused of taking money from the CIA to do what she's doing. And she has to continuously post videos. She's like, look at my refrigerator. There's nothing but ice and a water bottle inside. Like, I don't have anything. If I had CIA money, wouldn't I have an actual refrigerator filled with food? Or wouldn't I, you know, and she has no Just way of Just a bunch of guns. That's all she would right. have. <laughs> right. She has nothing. And she's like, I, I mean, I have no way of protecting myself. I don't have anything to eat. Like, wouldn't I have more? So, you know, it's kind of almost the same disinformation campaigns in both places um, you know, and, and it's starting to weigh on me and like, wait a minute, I don't think anymore that our government is here to actually help. 
I don't know that I ever truly believe that they were, but as time progresses, it's just more obvious. And it's it's more sinister than we, I think, originally thought. And that's the part that, that really worries me. You know, we're so accustomed to, well, the United States government, they're so benevolent, they're educating our children for us. Are they? What are they teaching our kids? And, and forget about the critical race theory and, you know, people like to talk about these things as if that was really what was happening. Let's just look at the basics. Our kids aren't learning the things that they need to learn. They don't learn how to pay their taxes. They don't learn things like, hey, the government takes taxes from you before, you know, depositing it in your bank account. And by the way, that same amount, they take it from your employer. So if you got $100 deducted, your employer paid another 100 for you. You know, that's money that could have been in your pocket. But they don't learn any of that. They don't learn how to manage their finances. They don't learn skills that they could actually use so that they can have a job when they leave no. 12th grade. You know, there's all these things. And then they're basically teaching you to be dependent on the system. How is that benefiting our kids? Our kids don't even, you know, you can talk to a group of young kids in a city and a lot of them don't even realize that their food comes from an animal. Um, and it, yeah. there's such a weird disconnect. Like children these days don't understand that that cow that's mooing over there is where your hamburger comes from yeah. you know like it's so weird and so the more i go down this rabbit hole of like hmm, i wonder why <laughs> i think my tinfoil hat just keeps growing and growing well and... you know i don't think it's a tinfoil hat thing um if it keeps coming true i mean the the difference between a conspiracy theory and the truth is about six months time you know <laughs> so true. like at this point, a lot of, a lot of, not all, but a lot of the conspiracy theorists are a lot more truthful than pretty much any large media outlet. I mean, I won't trust CNN as far as I could throw them if that was a uh, physically possible thing. You know, it's, it's that is state run media for sure. Yeah. But um, I think all our media, media is state run media, to be honest. I think that. Oh, yeah. Well, there's you know, six I, companies that own all right. media companies. So, yeah, I mean, it used to, you used to be able to be like, well, MSNBC and Fox. So I think that they do have different messaging. I do think oh, that yeah. there's a concerted effort to have two groups and to always pin them against each other. And so there is, you know, because people are like, well, but one is like says different things than the other one. Yes. And you can have two. But they're always yeah. off. Like they're, they're, yeah. you know, even their pundits, it's like, it's really, that's what you got out of that. So yeah, I, I think that we're yeah. really living in an era that there is propaganda and it's for whatever reason, as Americans, we just don't notice it as much. We can see well, it when we look back and like, you know, you can look at Germany yeah. and their posters and be like, how did anyone fall for that? I believe that in a few years, people are going to look back in America and be like, Haha, somebody <laughs> fell for this. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, propaganda works. Uh, psychologically through a thing it, it's known as uh, the repeat exposure effect and you just keep repeating it you just keep repeating it and repeating it and eventually uh, eventually people, everyone falls for it yeah uh, that's uh, exactly why uh, I would say 98% of most music that's on the radio sounds the exact same you know it's there's it's devoid of of any character, any actual artistic talent and uh, ingenuity or anything, it, it all sounds the same. You know, there's six people, six uh, music producers that produce all the music for, you know, the chart topping uh, artists. And so everything help, sounds the same. They replay it constantly too. If you turn exactly. on the radio, it's constant replay of the same few songs. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. And to uh, kind of backpedal a little bit about the, the, the school thing, you know, if, if school was actually helping, if they were actually trying to produce productive citizens, um, this is something I, I believe down to my core, um, children wouldn't be told the lie that you have to go to college to get a good job. Um, right. Not everyone needs to go to college also, the more people I that go to college, least, yeah, the the less it's worth. And so, there is nothing wrong with being the garbage man and actually earning a very decent wage. A, you know, working for the city. You know, there. 
I don't understand that that job is making more than the teacher telling you that you have to go to college. Um, it seems Think like they Mike are Rowe, that that dirty jobs oh, yeah. guy. I, I mean, he's he's I'm, I'm surprised he's not a, a, officially a libertarian or in the libertarian party because he seems very libertarian and he talks about trades. Go to trade school. And I think that's missing. I, I agree with you. If the schools really yeah. cared about you, really cared about educating you, there would be a track where some kids, maybe in the 11th or 12th grade, they go learn a skill like electricity or plumbing or HVAC or, you know, things that, I mean, people who repair air conditionings, especially here in Miami where, you know, it's hot. Um, yeah. They make hundreds of dollars, you know, a day repairing ACs. That's There's nothing... To, there's nothing to you know bad about that that's that's an honorable job that will make you yeah. money and so why aren't we you know college isn't for everyone everyone can't take four years out of their lives to go do more education after they've reached the 12th grade um you know it just it's it doesn't make any sense it does not make well sense. and it's it's just it, it is a flat out lie that you have to go to college to get a good job that is not true there are several uh, several different jobs that do not require even a high school education to where you could make a very comfortable living. Right. So, I mean, it, it seems like uh, they're trying to channel a lot of very impressionable um, aged people to be able to go into propaganda farms and mm -hmm. just pump them full of socialist, communist, propaganda and then they come out wearing Che Guevara t-shirts and, and in debt. screaming about you know the workers revolution right so and they're in debt and I mean think about the amount of pressure it must be to come out of school to be young and to have this debt over your shoulders and then you get a really low paying job you know uh, doing something probably not even related to your degree because let's be honest mm -hmm. you know there's not that many woman's liberal study jobs or whatever <laughs> and so i mean you're left with this feeling that the world is against you and in mm -hmm. fact it might be in that case i mean it's it's just why are we doing this to our youth why are we saddling them with depression and anxiety you know no. why why like i have three boys and you know when my son i have one that is just hyperactive i mean but not in the sense that like I didn't think he needed a medication and I got I got called into the teacher's office when he was in third grade and he, they said he needs to be tested. We think he has ADHD and I took him to get tested and they're like, he's a normal boy. Maybe they should just let him have his PE. So thankfully, uh, my kids go to private school and I was able to sit down with the um, yeah. principal and say, my kid just needs a little time to let off the steam. And then you can sit him down for eight hours a day. So um, yeah. why are we treating you know kids like they're all the same? Like they all need to sit down at a desk for eight to 10 hours a day and just hammer these things out. Kids aren't like that. I've, I have four. They're, just, no. they're, they're not like that. They're not, and especially not boys. Why are we forcing them to act this way? That makes no sense whatsoever. And it's like, well, we don't have money for, um, you know, PE and, and art and, and, and music. Since when? Miami-Dade yeah. County alone educates 350,000 kids and we have a $7 billion budget for education. Yeah. I'm sorry, if you have that kind of money, that's $20,000 per student, you better have, I mean, that's more than all of the, our private schools pretty much, except for the extremely expensive uh, hoity-toity schools. That's <laughs> more than all of them put together. So, it, you know, and those Jeez. schools have arts, those schools have um, music, those kids are able to go out and play and the teachers are paid better. So somehow, somewhere there's a black void that all that money's falling into and we're not talking about it. We're just like, maybe our kids need Ritalin or whatever yeah. it is that we give them. Yeah, let's just get whatever. them on antidepressants, uh, anxiety medication, just, just pump them full of drugs. They'll be fine, you know. Some, some so kids sad. will be sleepy. Some kids will sit there and be able to laser, uh, in, in a very unhealthy way, be able to laser focus to where no human <laughs> should be able to do that. <laughs> you know, it's like... I mean, to then regurgitate information, because again, yeah. you know, just, I, I look at what my kids are studying and I'm like, really, it. how does it help that you know every capital of America? I'm glad they do. I mean, um, don't get me wrong. I love that my kids know, you know, whatever the capital of every city is, but it's kind of just information that's, 
I, I don't know. I just don't see it as important. Yeah. And again, maybe I've gone down this rabbit hole and my, you know, my, my, uh, my tinfoil hat is just there. But why? I mean, why don't we teach them stuff that can actually benefit them? It's just. Well, I mean, it, it really comes down to uh, two options. It's, it's really uh, either the people making these choices are completely incapable of making these choices and so they are or they they shouldn't be in these positions in the first place or they're doing it on purpose they're they're doing it maliciously um i mean you look at certain people like george w and he uh he i i don't know he was a party guy so you know he was uh he was a figurehead more than anything but then you look at people um, like Biden in his heyday, not now, <laughs> but when he was still in his when mind. When he wasn't pooping his pants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was just a costume change. Don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> but a lot of these people, they, they are very corrupt. I yeah. mean, so some of them, yeah, they're probably just dumb and have no clue of the effect of their choices. Um, however, some of these people know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look at like, you know, and I say this all the time, like when I was growing up and I looked at politicians, I used to be like, oh, wow, they probably did something magical to get there. Right. Like they must be really intelligent Mm -hmm. or they must be something, whatever, fill in the blank. The cream of the crop of our society. The cream of the crop. And then as I've gotten to actually meet these people and hear the ideas coming out of their mouth, I'm like. I think anybody could be a politician and that's no. why I'm running. <laughs> anybody can do it. So let me let me do it too. Um, yeah, I don't think that they're the smartest of the bunch. And, and there's something to be said for somebody who's never had to um, create a job themselves. Biden no. has been in government his entire life. He's never actually no. created a job. He talks about creating jobs, but there's a very different dynamic from saying, if I do this thing, it's going to create jobs. It's like... Um, you know, South Park, the, the steal the underpants, question mark, profit. I don't think yeah. he knows. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he knows, you know, the steps that are involved in it. So, he, you know, here he is, the leader of the free world. And he just, you know, he made these laws, these these draconian laws that are, you know, the drug, the drug war. And he sure, he created plenty of jobs in the, in the private prison system and, the you know, just policing and... But really, more government the, jobs. More government jobs. What has he done to actually make a difference in our everyday lives? What has he done to improve the economy or whatever? And and don't get me wrong, I don't think any human being um, can be president. I don't think anybody can do a good job and, and fix it. I mean, this country has 350 million people in it. That is like the largest corporation on earth. Mm-hmm. Running this position would be something for a genius and even then, I think the genius would need more help. So, like, for example, Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, whoever you want to put in that position, they would have a hard time doing this. We put in a 78-year-old senile man, and we're like, gee, I wonder why it's not working out. I don't know what to tell you. I think that, you know, Damn, the guy... my groceries are more expensive. <laughs> Yeah, you know, where do you, what do you think is going to happen? The man took a plane across the world to make it all the way to this climate change conference because it was so important. And then we see him sleeping at it. Mm-hmm. It was so important that we had to take and spend all this money and all this, you know, take all these people in an 80 car motorcade. It was so important. And then he just passes out in the middle of it. What were we thinking when we hired a 78 year old man? You know, I, I saw somebody, uh, I, I believe it was on uh, Twitter uh, a little while ago, said something about how, in general, um, you know, 70 to 80-year-olds are considered unemployable due to uh, mental and physical decline. Uh, however, we have a 70, uh, high 70s-year-old man running, you know, supposedly the most powerful country in the world. So yeah. it's... Uh, it it doesn't add up. It doesn't. You know, add up. it's it's really confusing, and that's why I personally believe that uh, a lot of this is really done by design, or at least by plan. Uh, people are pulling strings, and they know exactly what they're doing. Um, I mean, we we uh, have these. You know, to bring it back to the school thing, we we have these kids coming out of university, 
and I mean they're they're taught all kinds of uh, just critical theory in general, uh, critical critical uh, gender theory, critical race theory, all these other uh, theoreticals. Like they're they're great thought experiments, but they're not reality. Um, yet we have you know the the example of uh, Cuba right now, right in front of our eyes, uh, Venezuela. Um, all kinds of different Latin American countries collapsing. We have over a hundred years of evidence that communism and socialism does not work and it always ends in suffering and death. Yet, there has been a rise in people calling for communist revolution in the United States especially. Um, you personally, what do you believe that reason or the, the reason behind that is um, with such blatant examples? A, we can go back to education. People have not been educated as to why that is the case, right? So you can ask people who are asking, you know, what what they want, and it's free education and free this and free that, and, and they don't understand, right? It's, it's not that we don't want you to have an education. It's not that we don't want you to have um, health care. It's just you can't demand that somebody else gives you these things. It's not how the world works. And except for having a government that is so powerful that they can force people to do these things at the threat of the gun that's the only way you're going to get them so that's you know i think our education is the number one problem but then let's just think about human nature if you if everybody could choose if, if food just magically arrived to your house the electricity was just always on everything was just provided for you i don't know about you but i really wouldn't want to work either i think you know it takes courage it takes a lot of gumption to start a business for example it takes you know um it, it's 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 terrifying as an entrepreneur myself it's a terrifying i've been in a position I, i'm currently in this position i'm in the middle of launching a brand and it's terrifying i'm putting money in and i'm telling people come work for me come do this thing with me but if i fail it's not just me your family's not going to eat you know and that's something that that is just so um, you know, people talk about it like, oh, well, Jeff Bezos doesn't deserve the money he makes. Yes, he does. Because I remember I'm old enough to have lived in a time where when, for example, my son, who's now 21, needed books and stuff for school. You know, I'd get the, the list for the school and he needed pencils and whatever. I had to go brave it out in Walmart, you know, and, and it was like, <laughs> oh, they didn't have all the things that we needed. And then go to Home Depot uh, or Office Depot or Office Max or whatever and buy all these things and lug it around. Now, or for the last 10 plus years, I've been able to, you know, that it's been like next day shipping or whatever. We've yeah. had it, we've obviously had the internet for a little bit longer than that. Yeah. But, you know, you can just Amazon Prime and boom, the next day I've got stuff on my doorstep. It's it's I'm so spoiled that when it says like, oh, it won't arrive for a week, I'm like, meh, I'll find somebody else. You know, like we are yeah. so accustomed to I'll actually to go out to go life. get it. Right. I'll actually have to go and get it. What is this? Like, why? <laughs> so, you know, he deserves every penny he's made because no. he changed our lives for the better. If COVID would have happened before Amazon was a thing, you would have had an uprising a hell of a lot sooner. The problem is we all got to sit at home. Food was delivered. We can Uber Eats your next meal. You know, it's we are living a very comfortable life. And that has yeah. happened because entrepreneurs took it upon themselves to say, you know what, I'm going to fix this problem or I'm going to solve a problem that people didn't even know they had. Drunk driving has gotten better since Uber uh, it was a thing because now you go out with your buddies and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to Uber there so that I don't have to worry about parking and driving. That's and a blah, lot blah, cheaper blah. than a DUI. <laughs> right. It's crazy. And, you know, again, I'm old enough to remember when I had to yeah. be like, well, I'm a little tipsy. What do I do? Do I wait two to three hours or do I drive home and risk it? You know, people don't realize how much better we have it now. And, and, and so that's kind of the thing. We have a short attention span. We don't realize, you know, how wonderful life is and how much these companies have improved our lives. So we're sitting around at home enjoying all these comforts. You know, socialism is really easy to sell in America from the comfort of your home with fast Wi-Fi and Starbucks in your in your hand and everything's <laughs> great. I mean, Cuba is known for its coffee and yet Cubans yeah. don't have coffee. There's no coffee mm. for the Cubans to drink. There's no sugar. Yeah. Cuba used to export sugar <laughs> to like everywhere around the world. And now Cubans don't have sugar for their coffees. So this is the problem. It's really easy to sell communism and socialism here in America because we have everything. Because there's people that get up every day and love to work and will work. 
But once you make it really difficult, they're not going to do it. This is Atlas Shrugged. It's just, unfortunately, Atlas Shrugged is a really long book and people you get bored reading it. But if, if it was a yeah. better book, <laughs> you know, maybe a quicker read, maybe a little bit more um, dystopian novel, like, you know, things that people actually like to read, they'd understand the concept. Yeah. There comes a point where people just get fed up and won't do it. And then we're all living like in Cuba. Yeah. Slippery slope. Well, it's, uh, you know, that uh, bad times create strong men strong men create good times good times create weak men you know it, it's just that yep. cycle all over again and you know it, it always seems to be uh, a lot of uh well off children teenagers young adults that always are drawn to this whole uh socialism communism thing it's like well you know they're not even thinking about the fact of how they have everything taken care of for themselves, um, either, you know, inheritance or just because mommy, daddy are doing it for for them or whatever. You know, it's it's like, well, I have everything. Well, then everyone else should have everything as well. You know, like it's Hollywood like, actors. Hmm? Where, yeah. you know, and a lot of them struggle at the beginning, right? You hear about yeah. all these Hollywood actors that they're like, you know, wait tables and whatnot, which is not really struggling, but whatever. For them, it is. And then they <laughs> yeah. and then they get to, you know, to this place where somebody's just offering them millions of dollars for playing pretend for a few hours. So, you know, then it's like they I think it turns into like feeling guilty about everything that they do have. And then it's like, well, everyone should have this. And they're out preaching this thing and they don't realize how how privileged they are how amazing it is to be able to live that lifestyle to have everybody yeah. you know worship you just because you were in a movie or because you know you look good in this dress so i think it's our culture i really do think that that it's really easy to sell here because we're not at that point yet once once it yeah. once it becomes real <clears throat> well it'll be harder you know it it's very appealing you know it sounds very sexy it's like just this idea that to these people, yeah. I mean, it's a lot better than, hey, do you want to, you know, be responsible for every choice you make? And, That's you know, true. like, you do got a point there. <laughs> I will admit, as a, uh, you know, uh, anarcho capitalist leaning libertarian, uh, my position is uh, promoting personal responsibility. And uh, that's a very tough sell. It is um, a tough sell. Oh, my God, especially yeah. to the young crowd. Again, I have a 21-year-old, and it's like, you need to do these things, but why? You know, this is this yeah. is the mentality we've we've yeah. we, we've created. I myself have created one of these. You know, yeah. and, where, and see, that's what I'm saying. It it sounds very appealing. It's it's very attractive. Uh, it's like, yeah, everyone should just have their fair share. And it's like, okay, that what what does fair right. mean? Fair is a trigger word. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> like, and what is your fair share of what somebody else worked? So it's really easy yeah. to say something like, oh, well, Elon Musk owes me money because, you know, he has so much of it. But for example, would you say that of a farmer, a farmer that has 100,000 yeah. acres? Would you just be like, I am entitled to all of this corn that you just picked? No, you don't, because you can see how that's work. You yeah. can see how that farmer has to plant the seeds and wait for it to grow. And, you know, so nobody just goes and like, well, I deserve that farmer shouldn't have that because it's mine. But we do that to somebody like Elon Musk, because all yeah. you see is this glossy car is coming off the lot. And you're like, well, he didn't do anything to earn it. Yes, he did. Well, I mean, he it's did. like uh, anytime uh, communism or socialism gets, you know, put put in place, uh, productivity always goes down because you know people are making the same wage you you are expected to produce goods and or services just for the sake of other people being alive right people work on incentives that's it mm -hmm. um it, that's the biggest it, problem it sounds bad but it's it yeah. really is just a you know i agreed to do it for this and you agreed to give me this like that's this is how life works. So, right. So, and socialism goes against human nature. Human nature yeah. is that you will do, you will work on incentive. I mean, yeah. it's like that for everything. It's even like that in dating. You're not going to take some girl out yeah. and buy her dinner and, you know, take her to some fancy place if you know for a fact she's going to friend zone you. Everybody, everybody, everything in our lives, 
works on an incentive. It just is. I mean, unless, well, maybe being a parent, maybe, and even still, I think there is some incentive. You know, you have the love of yeah. this child and, you know, and, and you, there's a biological element to that. But other than that, I think everything is an yeah. incentive relationship. Yeah. And I, I think uh, at, at, at the core argument, uh, you know, uh, status, communists, they, they really try to demonize that, that wanting something or exchanging something voluntarily uh, between two consenting parties is somehow immoral. Right. Like that's <laughs> exploitation. Um, right. I'm not sure how that works. And that's where I always trip up. It's like, um, you know, if I don't like this job, I'll go somewhere else. If it's not fair for me, it's costing me money or it's just not enough money or whatever. You always hear I'll, that argument though, but but somebody else you know, can't can't leave that job. You have to you have to make it fair for everyone because what if that one person can't leave or what if that one person So let's make it miserable for everyone because yeah. maybe potentially there's this one person that you haven't actually identified but you think might exist. Yeah. Let's make it for that person. It, it's such a weird I think we're having a hard time understanding it because we're not. I think this conversation yeah, is probably yeah. better had with the socialists so that they can explain it to us. But of course, we can't have a rational discussion either there. Yeah, um, yeah. So I have hard. those discussions all the time and I still don't understand it, you know. I don't get it either. And they don't understand us. And I think no. that's okay. You know, I think that, that in a society of the way libertarians see it, we're okay living amongst socialists. We just don't want them to force no. that on us. And I actually think that socialism isn't a problem if it's chosen. So if you want to live, for example, in a no. commune and everybody decides that we're just going to all work together and for the greater good, I think that would be a beautiful thing. You go do it. I personally no. don't want to live like that. I, I don't. I, I make I don't this joke to live my kids all the time. Commune. I, well, even if it's not hippie, even if it's whatever, that's not my style. I am very yeah. much a dictator in my house, and my house things happen the way I want it to. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't want to go live in, in a commune, but I yeah. wouldn't take that option from somebody else. And current culture is just so weird. Uh, you know, it's like right now we're canceling people if you don't like, um, you know, if you don't like the appropriate sexual partner or if like you yeah. you say that you won't date somebody who's trans like there's like a cancel culture for that and it's, it's just such a weird time to be alive since when is that a thing like i remember a time when you could say i like blondes or i like brunettes mm -hmm. <laughs> why is saying that you know why is saying something like i enjoy this thing or don't enjoy this thing why is that bad we're such a weird it's it's the judgment thing you know yeah shame Shame is a bad thing to a lot of these people. Don't, uh, yeah, just don't shame. Like, don't blank shame. Just like fill in the blank and just, that's, uh, the when modern did this trope. A thing, though? It's so. Uh, maybe, Making people I, feel I, bad, you know? It's, yeah, it's like, yeah. um, this cancel guess, culture. Yeah, guess what? Um, shame is actually a good thing. It, uh, keeps us, uh, from going too far in either direction, um, there there is a balance to life, you know. Um, and I mean, I would never force anyone to uh, live a particular way. If they're comfortable in a either further direction, then that's them. Uh, but also, don't stop me from judging that, you know. Right. Um, I I don't You're have your to. Life the uh, way you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Just live your life. I, I, we're such busybodies. Just live your life. Exactly. And the biggest lesson I think I've, I've learned in life um, that I think a lot of uh, these cancel culture people could really learn from is uh, what people think about you and what people say about you is none of your damn business. It's Ooh, just not. That's a good one. Yeah. It, and it it's just matter. not. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Don't concern yourself with, with it. I don't really care what people think of me. So I've been able to get yeah. away from that but i do see it a lot and especially you know when you look at like liberty twitter or whatever we're constantly oh at each other's throat <laughs> we're constantly telling other people what they should think or what they should do you're and not then, a real you know, libertarian <laughs> you're not a real libertarian is is my yeah. favorite line it's like i guess i'm not a real libertarian then but no. I, you know we we talk about liberty but then we don't act liberty yeah. and that's 
that's something that has also been an eye opener, I think, especially in the last year, is how quickly we are to cancel each other. And it's kind of funny that we self sabotage. We, yes. And even beyond that, we talk about the L LNC or the Libertarian Party, and we're like, well, the Libertarian Party needs to do this. And they suck because <laughs> they're not doing this. And I just want to point out to Libertarians that um, we talk about the government doing things and we're like, the government shouldn't do anything. We should do it ourselves. And we don't realize that we're doing that to the Libertarian Party. We're like, the Libertarian Party needs to do this. Well, let me explain something to you. The Libertarian Party is made up of volunteers. From Whitney, who is the uh, current uh, chair, all the way down to the last region rep. They are all mm -hmm. volunteers. They get zero dollars and zero cents from doing this job. They do it out of, God bless them, the goodness of their heart. They are, you know, doing these these things. And people were sitting here, you've got all these celebritarians or whatever you want to call them. And they're the people that should be doing the work of, you know, getting our message out there. And instead of promoting those those libertarians that are getting things out there, we're like, we're bashing the LNC, which this isn't even their job. Their job is to make sure that the bylaws and, you know, we have a path to getting a president into place and they're there to get ballot access. They're there for the, the actual things that matter to a party. The rest yeah. of that, that's on us. If you like somebody's messaging, if you like any one of them, I don't know, um, I, I, I won't mention, mention names, just anyone, promote them, yeah. help them, call them up, send them a message. Hey, how can I help you reach more people? What can I do? Stop bashing people. It's so counterproductive. And it's exactly what we talk about. It's exactly mm -hmm. it. You know, we're like the government. Well, the LNC isn't going to do it. So you do it. The LNC is all of us. Let's just yeah. let's just do it. Stop being on each other's asses so much. Yeah. No, I 100% agree. 100% so agree. And uh, so uh, that, that actually leads me to uh, a, a question that uh, I was given to be able to uh, ask you. Um, okay. What, what would you like to see like, if you had a magic wand, uh, could just snap your fingers. What would you like to see done in the Libertarian Party? Um, so again, let's go back to what its function is. I would like to see us having 50 state ballot access guaranteed every year so that we don't have to go around and, or every four years or whatever, so that we don't have to go around and collect signatures. States like Tennessee that we need to collect 56,000 signatures. It takes us a million dollars and two years to get it done. I'd love to see that go away. If we work hard enough together, that's something that we can achieve. I'd also like to see the LNC or the Libertarian Party or whatever we want to call it. I'd like to see them get their things together, their crap together, and offer candidates. We saw we saw right now with Pennsylvania over 150 Libertarians get elected. I assure you the vast majority of them did not have help. It's so bad that the Libertarian Party still doesn't even have a list of who won. So I can assure you that there was not a... Um, you know, a consensus that you don't have a campaign in a box. I can tell you with my own campaign, yes, they offered us candidate training. And it was the first time I went to, I think the first or the second iteration that they did. It was fantastic. I appreciate all the hard work that went into it. I appreciate yeah, the knowledge I, that I they gave away. I went to region training. It was great. Right. It was great. But you know what? You leave there and you still don't have a website. You don't have business cards. You don't have a campaign site. You don't have donations accepted. I want you to train me but I want you to take it a step further. I want you to have every candidate leave there with some tangible good. I want them, you know, why don't we have a, a dedicated team to building a, just out of the box website for people? That's a, that's a struggle for yeah. the majority. It's been a struggle for me. I just got my website launched and there's still some things that I need to fix in it. There's still some, you know, stuff that's going on, but that was a challenge, super hard. Branding, challenged. Um, you know, so many, how to fundraise is great. Why don't we have people helping, calling up all the donors at once and saying, hey, what state do you care to fund for? Do you want to help uh, Martha in Florida or Ashley Shade in, in, in um, Massachusetts? Where, you know, like we need a team that is dedicated to winning. That's yeah. what we need. So on my end, I just want to see the, the Libertarian Party you know, do the things that we need them to do. Forget about messaging. We're dying to have them put out videos and it's not their job. Yeah. The Republican Party doesn't do it. The Democratic Party doesn't do it. 
They may control it. They may try and, and you know, massage it. But you see all their paid advertising. It's done outside of the, it doesn't say paid for by the Republican National Committee. No, it's paid for by this pack or paid for by this thing. We need that. And that's one of the yeah. things that I love about People for Liberty. That is exactly what they're doing, but they don't belong to the Libertarian Party. They're a nonpartisan, um, yeah. you know, and they they are doing those things. They have offered me a ton of help, a ton of um, support and, 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 you know, especially with the People for Cuba thing, not so much my campaign, but mostly over, you know, this type of stuff. And that's what we need. We need yeah. more people that know how to do those things. So that's what I like to see the LNC. And as far as the libertarians, I'd like to see them stop talking about the LNC so much. I'd like yeah. to see them <laughs> do. I mean, this takeover, it's like, what are you taking over? What are what is the Mises caucus taking? And don't get me wrong. I adore especially the Mises caucus of Florida. They're great guys and girls in there. There's great people. There's um, they've got, you know, they're, they're definitely moving and shaking things up. I just I hate this takeover language. I think it's I think it's separating us. I think it's doing what um, politics is doing across America. It's doing it to the Libertarian Party. And I know we've had division forever. That's not new, but it's capitalizing on that division. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, old, old wounds in the Libertarian mm -hmm. Party, you know, all, all the and way back to the wounds. founding, you know, there's um, silly wounds, though. Well, it's, it's not even... uh, dead people's baggage, you know, right. Um, Let it go. And uh, I don't know. I'm I'm torn. So I mean, full disclosure. I'm I'm Mises Caucus. Right. Um, however, I don't like. I do that for me, not for anyone else. <laughs> you know, like right. it's. I want it's not to see my bold place. messaging. Yeah. I love that the Mises Caucus has bold messaging. Yeah. Particularly, that's a brand that appeals to me. But again, well, I, I, you know, I think other people do as well. Uh, look mm -hmm. at Spike Cohen and the the Waffle House Caucus. Um, you know, personally for for myself, I would like in instead of libertarians bitching about what other libertarians should be messaging about, why don't you just take that energy and message it yourself? Right. You know, I agree totally, just, wholeheartedly. Yeah. Just do it. You know, mm -hmm. and if it's not, if it doesn't hit with the chord with people, you'll find out you won't have a following. Yeah. And that's fine. You know, not everybody is going to be everybody's cup of tea. There's a yeah. saying in Spanish. My mom used to tell me when I was little, um, no eres monedita de oro. You're not a, a gold coin. And what does that mean? Well, every, who doesn't like a gold coin, right? Everybody likes a gold coin. Well, you're yeah. not a gold coin. Not everybody's going to like you. Sorry. It's just, the, you yeah. know, I know I rub plenty of people the wrong way. I know it. I'm okay with that. I'm sorry yeah. if I'm not your cup of tea. I'm sorry if I'm not your gold coin. I may be other people's. I may be nobody's. But it's okay. And we sh we have room for all of these people. We don't all have to yeah. be friends. Well, and the honestly, one one of the things that draws me into the libertarian philosophy in general, um, it, like people are looking at our differences, um, regardless of. Uh, choice of caucus or choice of no caucus or uh, big L, little L, uh, whatever, if you want to run for office, don't run for office. It doesn't matter. If you're a libertarian, there's all these differences. And it seems like people are focusing on how these are negative. The right. beautiful part of the libertarians is we're all is different. We're different, yeah. Exactly. And I mean, I see that I live in Miami, you know, people are like, well, we can't let in Hispanics because it's going to change our culture. Listen, y'all come to my town for my culture. Like, you know, this is the beautiful thing yeah. about America. You go to, you can go to Chicago and have a completely different culture. You can go to yeah. the Midwest somewhere and have completely different culture. Like I've, I was in South Dakota for um, Freedom Fest, completely different culture to what I'm used to. And that's the beauty yeah. of America is that we are different. We are different all yeah. around, you know, LA is completely different to New York, even though they're both huge metropolitan cities. So why? Why is this like we all have to be this? Where is this coming from? And in a libertarian party, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I think it um, <clears throat> it's more of this divide and conquer kind of thing. You know, it's the, the best way to divide the libertarians. Um, I honestly think that e 
even the takeover language itself, like I, obviously some people are still not going to like it. Some people will love it. Some people will be indifferent. Um, but I, I really do believe that there's been some sort of, uh, hold on, let me put my tinfoil hat on, um, the, <laughs> that there has been some sort of, uh, infiltration through, I, I don't know, just that division, just that divide and conquer, you know, it's just right. focusing on the differences, little nitpicky things here and there and it snowballs. It does and, snowball. and that's the and perfect way to keep the libertarians focused on these dumb little things so we can't band together and actually make a change. And do you think that's on purpose? Because I believe that to some degree, there is some outside influence that is doing this. As long as we can't get our stuff together and work together for the greater good, this is going to keep us down and this is going to keep the Republicans and the Democrats winning, which is why, even though I've had my issues with people within the party, even though I am very vocal and, you know, I will call people out sometimes. And yeah, that's not no. great. I'm not saying I'm perfect. Um, I will go and, and apologize and I will tell people when I was wrong and I will, you know, and I think yeah. we need to work together. And if, again, don't like me, that's fine, but we can still work together. I am not shut off from working with everybody in the party. Um, yeah. and, and building those bridges because we have to. We are in a point right now that if we are smart, if we, you know, we love to think we are, we're like all these big brainiacs, but then we just yeah. can't get our shit together. If we do, we would take over the politics of this country right now. Democrats, they mm -hmm. just proved, they just proved that nobody wants what they're selling. People don't want it. They've rejected it. They're like, well, this is crap. What do you think is going to happen in, you know, the next election cycle if we come out strong against Republicans, against what they're selling? Because people rejected Democrats, but that doesn't mean that they like what the Republicans are selling. That just means that they prefer the Republicans because there really wasn't an option. And Pennsylvania is proving that when there's an option, people will vote for us. So yeah. let's capitalize. Let's push it out there. Um, I would love to see the list of everyone that, that won and congratulate each and every one of them and let's all get on board and let's help them. What do they need to make their job effective so that when they have wins, we can all claim them as wins too and say, look yeah. at what a libertarian is doing. Look at what he's doing. Look at Spike Cohen. You know, one guy, <clears throat> literally one guy out of South Carolina is going around the country and making waves because he's going to speak at these meetings and he's going to talk to people and saying, this is why passing this law is stupid or, you know, hurts you or yeah. whatever, like he just did here in Florida um, on the abortion ban. You know, and he, he didn't even talk about abortion, really. You know, he didn't talk about whether it was good or bad or we should do it or we shouldn't do it. He talked about why that law was just bad. We need more Spike Cohens, you know, oh, yeah. unless we can somehow duplicate him, unless we can just clone him. <laughs> You know, I challenge people to rise to the Spike Cohen level. Yeah. Let's get out there. Let's show people what we can do. Um, you know, in my own case, I, I feel like that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to yeah. prove that, you know, humanitarian aid to Cuba is not a political thing. I'm not doing it because I'm in yeah. politics. I'm doing it because helping people, volunteerism works. You know, I want to show Cubans in Cuba that have heard how it's the It's what makes us human. Right. And how they keep hearing, you know, they've heard their entire lives, this imperialist place that is America, they just want to crush you. Yeah. Imagine the, the knowledge of knowing that this imperialist country that hates you wants to help you and save your life by providing you with these medications that your own government won't allow you to get. I think that yeah. sends a huge, powerful message. And of course, it's not the reason why I'm doing it, but it's an added bonus. And I think we can find things like that. Um, big shout out to Dadman. Uh, Liberty Memes creator, uh, David Andrew Gay, because he is the embodiment of that. And I believe to date he's collected close to $2 million in it. Not collected because he does it, you know, where yeah. the money just goes straight to the person. But he has fundraised. He's been the funnel. Right. He's been the funnel to close to $2 million. Do you know how many lives he's changed? You know, just from this one page, just from doing what yeah. he does. And he goes out and he talks at all these events and he, you know... Um, He's doing a fantastic job. That's what we should be. More Spike Cohens, yeah. more Dadmans, more, 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 more. Look at Ashley Shade. She's also, you know, with um, Proud Libertarians. And I mean, we have these groups. Let's highlight them. Yeah. Well, I mean, all of these, uh, all of these people, they, they have their strengths. As long as we can put our best, uh, 
I'm, I'm not going to say best foot because it's a little too collectivist for me, but if, if we can put our best toes forward and, uh, because they're, they're all great at different things. Um, right. you're great at certain things that Ashley shade might not be. Um, right. Ashley shade is great at things that Dave Smith might not be, you know, exactly. there's all these people that are very great at very particular things and, and as they long all as we bring can... people in they all yes. bring people in you know so many people talk about how the ron paul revolution brought him in but what about john stossel he brought in a whole yeah. bunch of people what about gary johnson and i get it i know I, yes he 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 wasn't the perfect libertarian or whatever because everybody yeah. loves to hate gary johnson but he brought in so many people and even you know Joe Jorgensen, maybe she might might not be your cup of tea, but she brought in a lot of people, and um, yep. you know she's now working with People for Liberty, so I get to now have access to her and see her at all of these yeah. events, and it's crazy to see how people will come up to her and be like, you, you know, I came to the Libertarian Party because of you, and yet Libertarians are like, oh well, Joe, Jor you know, and they'll. I don't know how to politely say, and they'll shit on her, you know? And it's like, why? Yeah. Why? <laughs> She's bringing in people. Vermin Supreme, same thing. I think he's amazing. He does this amazing job. And yet people are like, oh, well, he's the crazy man who has a boot on his head. Listen, he might not be your cup of tea. Just move on. You don't have to call him out because he's not yeah. your cup of tea. Yeah. Oh, it's so annoying. That's, that, I think that's one of my biggest pet peeves is the, the haterade in the, in the party. I can agree. Definitely. So I, I definitely wanted, you know, not everything is doom and gloom, you know? Um, so that, that, that was definitely not quite as doom and gloom as we have gotten on this episode. Um, but I mean, they're, uh, bringing it back to Cuba, uh, just Latin America in general. Um, I, I've seen a lot of, uh, positives. Uh, one of these positives that I've seen is the finally, the citizens have had enough. They're finally fighting back in whatever way possible, regardless of the danger in doing so. Um, what are some of the victories that uh, you think that should be highlighted that you know of? So um, victories in Latin America. There are a few at this moment. I have to say, you know, we want to try and get away from the doom and gloom, but there's a lot of doom and gloom. There's a lot of socialism, but there is a candidate in Argentina and his name is Javier Milei, and he is a Latin American superstar. We're talking about like a libertarian, he's an economist who's running for some council position. I'm not sure, don't quote me on what he's running for, but he's in um, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and he has, I mean, he, he does an event and thousands upon thousands of people come to his events and are clamoring for more. And we need more of that. And of course, you have to have the personality for that. I mean, not yeah. everybody does. I think he's kind of more like the equivalent in America, maybe a Spike Cohen. I'm not even sure. You know, like we don't necessarily have this. He's very populist. I will say that much. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of populist. Um, but he, he's been able to draw so much attention. And he won. Um, uh, there's like the, the preliminaries. So he's moving on and he will be one of, I think, two candidates running. And he has a very good shot of winning. And Argentina that is sliding into a socialist hellhole, you know, it yeah. has at least this shining example. And if he doesn't win, he's at least like everybody in Latin America knows who he is now. And he has these great sayings, you know, like, I didn't come here to have sheep follow, like, I didn't come here so the sheep can follow me. I came here to wake up the lion. And people go crazy. It's like, yay, Javier Mile is like amazing. You know, he has these things and he just calls you to, to action. And I think that um, that's one of those things that in a country like Argentina to have somebody like Javier Mile, that's a huge win. In Cuba, the fight on November 15th, and we see um, there's over 80 cities worldwide that are going to be marching and having protests, uh, either the 14th of November or the 15th. I'd love to see more American cities taking it on. Uh, Miami and Tampa, New York and New Jersey, of course, the very uh, heavily Cuban-influenced yeah. cities are doing it. I'd love to see it everywhere. I'm not going to lie. I think that we need more if you're an american citizen and you hate what is going on in this country let alone around the world and what they're doing with your american tax dollars go out and protest and then um as i told you earlier before we went on um i do a show in spanish uh 
creating Latin uh, content, libertarian content in Spanish because there is nobody else doing it. The reality yeah. is Zach Foster and I are the only people doing it. And he and I uncovered a few months ago, it, that that was kind of known, the USA Aid created a report in April saying, hey guys, um, less than 2% of the money that we sent to, to Venezuela as humanitarian aid actually made it to the people of Venezuela. The rest of the money, we don't know where it went. And so there's this huge controversy because the government of Juan Guaido, which is the one that the United States was giving this money to, huge controversy. They had said that, um, you know, that they didn't know where the money went and all this other stuff. And it turns out they absolutely knew. And the um, ambassador of Venezuela to the United States, Carlos Vecchio, was actually the recipient of all of this money. And so that is what our show is going to be on hmm. tonight. We've uncovered this huge huge you know just billion dollars of your tax money is going to the interim government of venezuela which no longer is even the interim government and at this point it has reverted back to maduro so imagine your millions upon millions upon millions of dollars are going to somebody who isn't even the regime anymore and this money has been going they're <laughs> pulling it out of your and my pockets Mm. You can't use it for your family. I can't use it for my family. But we're going to send it to Venezuela. And the worst part is our government knows about it. They've done these reports. They, we have a redacted copy, so we can't see where they were supposed to go. We can't see a lot of information. But they know where it's going. And they know that it hasn't been going. And we can't even stop that. Going back to what we said at the beginning. No. Cannabis for 80 years, we can't get it We can't get it legalized. We can't get uh, government to get out of the way with the COVID things. And we can't get government to stop stealing from us and giving it to other people. And so, you know, there's a lot of good things happening. It's just very slow progression. Very slow. How do we get people to pay attention to the Venezuela thing? How do I get somebody... You know, and of course, tonight's show is in Spanish. I'm not intending it to be for the Americans, but I just posted a video. And um, after tonight's show, I will post all of the documents. And it's it's brilliant. They're in English and in Spanish. So there's no, um, I can't understand it. They're right there. You just need to know a little You're bit of the You're choosing context. not to look at it at right. that point. You're choosing not to look at it. And, you know, the reporter who called out the the regime and said hey where's that money he's coming on our show tonight so it's like i'm i'm super excited for this i'm super excited to to uncover these things and to share with the libertarians across america this is what your government's doing in latin america now help me out reshare it yeah. talk to people about what's going on let people know because here's this thing libertarians we've got plenty of news we we make our own news we make some great news you know and we're kind of like oh well that's her thing i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bother and it's really frustrating guys really freaking frustrating no this is our backyard you know yeah yeah latin Venezuela america is, our is a yeah it's that was such where we a were massive... getting our petroleum from they have the largest oil reserves in the world. If you think yeah. America went into the Middle East because of oil, then why haven't we gone into Venezuela? Yeah, no. Not Middle East was about to. heroin. Let's be honest. <laughs> you know, yeah. all those soldiers and Venezuela guarding could have poppy that too. shields. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Venezuela it's a, it's a has very, amazing uh, amounts of, uh, you know, we've got copper and lithium. I mean, Venezuela has everything, gold, diamond mines. Yeah. America, what are you doing? Same with it's right Mexico. in our backyard. Yeah, same same with Mexico. I mean, there's, it's all right there. I mean, it's. Uh, Isn't that it's, crazy? Uh, we are like, yeah, we want to conquer is, the is. world, but we're so terrible at it. We can't even, we can't even like do it. Like if you, if your goal was to like just, whatever, we're going to be the world power. We're just going to take over everyone. Why aren't we doing it in a place where we actually could do it? You know, not, yeah. I am not vouching for this. I'm not saying we should do this. I just don't want this taken out of context. I'm just laughing at how badly yeah. we do these things. That's my point yeah. is, you know, we suck so much that we even suck at, at you know, our world domination. We're like, yeah. eh, we do a terrible job of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in, in your, in your opinion, um, what is the best way for people to help this situation? Uh, wh whether it be through your, uh, your website, uh, peopleforcuba.com, um, or, you know, supporting you in your campaign, uh, 
what what's the best way for people to get involved to help? So um, going back to what I said earlier, I think that use your strong suit, whatever it is. If you have money, donate to campaigns, donate to, you know, uh, helping things again, people for Cuba or helping um, Liberty memes. If you've got an extra 10 bucks, throw it at one of these organizations. If you've got um, if you have a talent, you know, podcasting, let people come on, invite them on. If you have, um, you know, if you're really good at social media, maybe you could help. Uh, you know, with with candidates getting their message out there. If you have a big account, retweet them. If you have, you know, um, whatever it is, whatever your strong suit is, use it for good. You know, it's kind of like with great power, with great responsibility, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. Sorry, I totally messed that one up. <laughs> Total Spider-Man quote that I can't remember the right way. Anyways, you know, if you have something, use it. And I see that, uh, you know, I keep going back to Spike Cohen, but he is to me the ultimate libertarian in the sense that he has this thing. He has a voice. People like to hear him. People like to talk. Um, They hear him talk and and he does it and he does a real great job at it. Um, Dave Smith is great at telling jokes and and getting people to listen to him. He's on Rogan all the time. Um, He gets on Kennedy all the time. He's promoting our ideas. That's important. I think he's a fantastic beacon of what the Libertarian Party is. Tom Woods, I was just at his event uh, a few weeks ago. What an amazing event. This man got thousands of people to show up. That's a talent. Um, You know, let's use that. Why isn't Tom Woods uh, hosting more events for, you know, why aren't we bringing him into the fold and and letting him do his thing and, and educate more people? He's educating students. You know, he's got his whole homeschooling thing. Um, let's use people's talents. Yeah. Why do we put people in corners? I, I don't get it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we should all be helping each other up. Uh, right. You know, we're, we're all stepping stools and we're all going to the same location. I mean, uh, the, the way I had it explained to me uh, by a good friend was that uh, we're pretty much on a, on a freeway to liberty. And uh, really based on ideology, uh, Usually people just get off at exits earlier than others, you know, right. but w- we're all heading on that train towards, you know, you know freedom town. And if, you know, minarchist is your area, then you hop on off. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to go full blown anarchist, you stay on the train a little bit longer. But yeah, I agree. We're all going yeah. in the same direction. And I want to see us actually moving in that direction. So come on, guys. Chop, chop. Time is of the essence. <laughs> yeah. Let's exactly. get this party started. Now's the time. Now, now is, is time. our time. And, you know, everybody's always like, well, there's not enough women in the party. You know what? I hate to sound um, old timey. I don't know, whatever, maybe of not of this decade. But guys, y'all show up to the Libertarian Party events and you're not looking your best. That's why we don't have women here, because I looked around at the Tom Woods event and I saw a sea of eligible bachelors, a sea of it. And I hear from my women friends all over the place like, oh, there's no good men. You know what? They're here, but I can't post pictures about them all being here because nobody wants to show up. And, you know, like, come on, dress the part. Let's do this. Let's guys put a little effort into it. You know, take take a, uh, a lesson from Jordan B. Peterson. Clean up your room. You know, <laughs> start start with the room. Make your bed every day. Throw on some deodorant. I, mean, I don't even make. I don't make my bed every day, so that's don't. I, don't I did not say that. <laughs> I did not say that at all. I don't. No, I'm it's definitely a messy, something I'm a, we should strive to. I'm a terrible example of a woman. I don't make the bed, and I really don't. I can cook, but I'm not a good at it. I don't like to do it. I'm eh, whatever. That's all right. Um, I, I I think we can forgive you. So, so one last quick question. Right. Um, it, it was uh, one more that was uh, given to me uh, on behalf of somebody else. Um, Do we have a name for who somebody else is? This is like... Yeah, uh, Shaylee, uh, my wife. So, oh, awesome. Uh, yeah. So she, she actually I'm like, wanted... what a drama, mystery. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. So she, she wanted to know, uh, what is one thing that if you could go back to your younger self, what what's that one thing that you would tell yourself knowing what you know now oh my god this is a great question number one buy bitcoin (laughs) buy and hold for life um that would have been number one number two probably you know other stocks and whatever tesla yeah blah 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 the same thing that everybody says and then um 
I grew up in a very Catholic, very um, traditional Hispanic household. And I, um, I love my kids dearly and I don't regret it for a minute, but I probably would have told myself to think through what I really wanted to do. I am so beyond blessed and grateful that I get to do it now. Um, but I wish I would have started earlier. I wish I would have started in my 20s. I think that um, this thing, spreading liberty, this this whole bug, I, I wish I would have done it earlier. So probably, you know, rethink, rethink these things. And for women now, I, it makes me so happy to see that they have options. That, um, you know, and maybe this isn't such a thing for American women because they have been delaying having children and they have been delaying, um, you know, that, that family life. But for especially Hispanic women, think it through. You know, it's okay to not have yeah. kids. It's okay to have one kid and not four. <laughs> it's yeah. okay to, um, you know, not try and do the, the whole female role. So, yeah, that would yeah. probably be the thing that I would tell myself, but that might be too narrow for the Hispanic field. Yeah. Well, on that note, I think we'll wrap it up so we can, uh, you know, get you off of here, rest a little bit for your uh, next show. Um, so let everyone know uh, the, the best way to get a hold of you, uh, where people should go, uh, social media, whatever. Yeah, so um, I just hit 20K on Twitter today, which is huge for me. I'm like, yay. Yeah, I know. Th this is something that nobody else cares about, only me. But um, <laughs> it's a huge accomplishment for me. So on Twitter and on pretty much every social media, I'm under as at Bueno for Miami. Bueno, my last name for Miami. It's a double entendre, obviously. Uh, bueno is good in Spanish, so I'm good for Miami and Bueno for whatever. Um, that and then my website, MarthaBueno.com. And um, yeah, that's pretty much where you can find me. You can email me, call me. I, all my stuff is open. All my I'm, I'm here to, you know, I really love when people reach out to me with things, whatever it is, either it's something that they saw, something that they, I like it. I, I'm really a people person. And if I can help somebody else, I love to. So, um, you know, reach out. Yeah. Definitely uh, recommend going to follow uh, Martha's Twitter and Instagram. They're both fire. So uh, Thank you. definitely a, a, a must follow. So uh, you can find uh, this show at rise to liberty .com. Don't forget about rise to liberty .com slash blue dress for that species, that uh, special piece of merchandise. Um, also go to rise to liberty .com slash free speech for my telegram channel where we can have open and honest discussions without the threat of big tech censorship for now. So Martha, for it now. was, yeah, exactly. It was a true honor to have you on. Um, absolutely had a great time and, uh, Thank you we so will, much. of course. And, uh, yeah. anytime you want to come on, you're more than welcome. And either way, we'll get you back on. So thank you. I appreciate that. My race isn't until next year, November of 2022. So there will be a lot of time to keep talking about stuff. <laughs> and thank you so much. I really appreciate being here and um, having the opportunity to just talk about our issues. Yeah, exactly. Anytime. So until next time, stay free, my friends.